everyone. Welcome to A Good Night for a Murder, a Victorian true crime podcast. My name is Kim, and while researching stories for this podcast, I realized the content was skewing heavily towards violent crimes against women. And while those are important stories to tell, I wanted to make sure I was bringing a variety of topics to the table. And that's when I came across the story of a Victorian doomsday sex cult. You heard me right. A Victorian cult whose name translates to the abode of love. Please settle in for the story of the Agapemonites. But first, a Victorian society tip. To us today, it may seem like the Victorians were morbidly preoccupied with death. But in reality, the Victorians lived alongside death. Of course they thought about it a lot. So much so that they developed an elaborate extended rituals and customs for every step of the funeral and mourning process. These rituals are what gave rise to what is called the Victorian cult of death, or a culture of death, that everyone was indoctrinated to. I will now share a few pieces of mourning etiquette from the Victorian cult of death. No member of the immediate family of the deceased will leave the house between the time of death and the funeral. A lady friend will be commissioned to make all necessary purchases, engage seamstresses, etc. There should be no calls upon the bereaved family while the dead remains in the house, and they may be excused if they refuse themselves to friends and relatives. There should be no loud talking nor confusion while the body remains in the house. It is desirable upon a death occurring in the house that some outward sign should be given to keep away casual visitors. The shutters on the street are kept closed. It is customary to tie all the window shutters with black and hang black upon the door. The notice of a death and the invitation to a funeral are usually made through the newspapers, though sometimes the invitation is given by means of private note. If no other invitation is given than that through the newspapers, it is best to add without further notice. These invitations must be delivered by private messenger. Whether other invitations are sent or not, notes must be sent to those who are desired to act as pallbearers. It is custom to send upon the occasion of a death to relatives and friends cards deeply edged in black, upon which are printed or engraved the name of the deceased, with his age and date of his death. These cards are immediately acknowledged by letters of condolence and offers of assistance. Those who wish to show themselves strict observers of etiquette keep their houses in twilight seclusion and somber with mourning for a year or more, allowing the piano to remain closed for the same length of time. For one year, all neckwear should be of black crepe lease in a form of a collar or ruches. No jewelry is allowable in the deepest mourning. A widow usually wears black crepe for one year, often longer, as suits her feelings. She lightens her somber black first by white collars and cuffs, then by gowns of black and white, or wears full silk or silk and wool. If you want to know more about the Victorian cult of death, including mourning customs, clothes, and why this was even a thing, I cover all of that in this episode's bonus content available exclusively through the butler and housekeeper tier of the Good Night for a Murder Patreon. This story starts with Henry James Prince, who was born in 1811 in the city of Bath in England. His family seemed to be fairly well off, owing much of their wealth to the owning of slave plantations in Jamaica. I know, we're off to a terrible start already. His father died, though, when he was about five, leaving a considerable inheritance to his wife, who would continue to raise Henry on her own, with the help of a lodger she took on, named Martha Freeman. Young Henry became an apprentice to a Somerset apothecary at the age of 14, then shortly after began studying medicine at Guy's Hospital in London. In 1832, he became a licentiate of the Society of Apothecaries, which, as far as I can tell, means he became a pharmacist. And he also became residential medical officer of the Bath General Hospital. So he wasn't stupid. He wasn't lazy. But only about three years into his career, he suffered some health problems that forced him to undergo some sort of operation. After this, practicing medicine was just too strenuous for him, and he left the field. At some point during his career in medicine, he also underwent what I can only find described as an evangelical conversion experience. This is what prompts him to begin studying ministry at Lampeter Theological College in Wales in 1837. While here, he surrounds himself with a group of like-minded religious enthusiasts that come to be known as the Lampeter Brethren. So 
These are the early days of what will go on to become essentially a doomsday cult with Henry James Prince as their leader. It's a tale as old as time, right? The end is near and Prince and Prince alone knows the secrets to salvation and he can lead you there if you let him. You'll have to give up all of your worldly wealth and possessions directly to him and he will cleanse you of your sin through the Holy Spirit who he embodies by making the sinful act of sex divine. In other words, if you sleep with him, you'll be purified and guaranteed to get into heaven when the second coming of Christ finally happens. Sounds crazy, right? Well, these individuals who become cult leaders have this very unique gift of being exceptionally charming and persuasive while instilling this sense of trust in themselves. Fear of the unknown, just like today, is paralyzing to people. And if someone can convince people that they know all the answers, people will latch onto that and not look back. Most of Prince's followers were young women, and in a society that didn't offer many options beyond become someone's wife or become old and sad because you weren't someone's wife, signing on with Prince gave them another option. Prince would arrange spiritual marriages with male followers, meaning the marriages were celibate. And again, if you didn't want to be married off to pump out babies, it may not seem like a bad deal. And these men who were devoted to Prince got to be surrounded by lovely women and benefited from the riches Prince acquired from his followers. So in 1838, Prince marries Martha Freeman, the older female lodger that lived with he and his mother while he was growing up. I mean, maybe they were in love, who's to say? But more likely, it was a strategic move on Prince's part to gain access to her money. She also came from a family of Jamaican plantation slave owners. So Prince finishes his schooling, and the next step is for him to be assigned as the curate to a church, meaning he'll lead the congregation. And the vice principal of the college he attended contacts the Bishop of Bath and Wells directly and is like, hey, this guy is, he's kind of a lot. We've got to place him somewhere far flung. So he gets sent to become the curate of Charlinch and Somerset, an off-the-beaten path, quiet, rural location. He is to work alongside Reverend Samuel Starkey, but Starkey is not well, and when Prince arrives, he pretty much has the run of the place. Attendance at the church was low until one service where Prince suddenly loses control of himself and starts bodily flinging himself around the church, prophesying, speaking in tongues, becoming seemingly possessed with the Holy Spirit. Word gets out about this, and the next week, more people turn out for church. And again, the same thing happens to Prince. In fact, it happens week after week and the congregation continues to grow. Reverend Starkey, who was supposed to be mentoring and guiding the new curate, jumps on board himself and becomes one of Prince's most devoted followers. In fact, after Prince's wife Martha dies in April of 1842, Starkey says, here, marry my sister, which Prince does a mere five months later. So as more and more members of the congregation start to put their faith in Prince, he divides the congregation into separate services for men and women. Then he divides them again into the sinners and the righteous. The demographic of the righteous was mostly all wealthy or single women. By this point, most of the attendants had accepted the fact that Prince was in fact himself the embodiment of the Holy Spirit and he was already contracting spiritual marriages amongst his followers. There was an investigation by the church who did see fit to officially remove both Reverend Starkey and Prince from their positions. And now, while this did slow them down for a while, it did not stop either of them from quickly organizing meetings in a local farmer's barn so they could continue preaching. Around this time, Prince estimates his following to be about 500, but it's reported the number is likely to be inflated and his following was closer to only 100. Either way, in 1845, Prince's followers officially licensed a number of buildings as chapels in Somerset. And they built a chapel at Spaxton within sight of the church where Prince first started preaching. Prince directs his followers to turn the chapel at Spaxton into what we would describe today as a compound. He names it Agapaname, meaning abode of love in Greek. The grounds included a 20-bedroom gabled house with turreted bay windows, an attached chapel, a gazebo, stables, cottages, and landscape gardens that they called, can you guess what they called their gardens? Eden. Uh, and it was all surrounded by a 15-foot wall. The second coming, by the way, was scheduled to happen in 1845. 
This was actually a widespread belief at the time that a number of unorthodox Protestant groups subscribed to in both Britain and the United States. It was based on some sort of numerological interpretation from the book of Daniel. So they built their compound and they wait. Also in 1845, princes made an impression on four sisters from a family named Nottage. The sisters were Harriet, Agnes, Clara, and Louisa. They all decided to travel to Agapeneme, where immediately upon arrival, Harriet, Agnes, and Clara were married off to three of Prince's leading clergymen. The fourth sister, Louisa, had not yet arrived. In true cult lifestyle fashion, the sisters were effectively cut off from their family and had not been allowed to contact anyone to inform them of their marriages, which all took place on the same day in July of 1845. Now, Harriet and Clara fell in line with life behind the walls at Agapaname and reportedly lived happily in their spiritual marriages for many years. But Agnes quickly became disillusioned with the whole scene and wrote to her sister Louisa, warning her not to come. But Louisa ignored her and turned up at the doors of Agapaname anyway. Prince welcomes her with open arms and puts her up in one of the cottages within their walls until he can find a suitable spouse for her. Meanwhile, the sister's mother, Emily, is beside herself, having effectively lost four of her girls now to whatever the hell is happening in Spaxton, and she sends her son, nephew, and son-in-law from another daughter's marriage to extract Louisa before it's too late. Despite everything about Agapenemy being designed to keep outsiders out, the three men manage to enter the compound and find Louisa, and they essentially abduct her. And she does not want rescuing. She fights and screams the whole way, and they bundle her off into a waiting coach and bring her to the brother-in-law's villa in London, where she repeatedly insists on Prince's divinity and expresses her will to go back. This is when her mother, Emily, has Louisa certified insane and has her committed to Moorcroft House Asylum in Hillingdon. The entire time she's there, she insists up and down that Prince is the holy reincarnation and God will punish them all for what they're doing to her while she will be saved for remaining devoted. She spends about two years there and then she escapes. Prince sends members of the congregation to try and meet her and bring her back to them, but she gets picked up by asylum officials first and is brought back to the hospital. Finally, Prince makes an appeal to the Commissioner of Lunacy, who declares Louisa to be sane, and she is released in 1848. Louisa then heads straight back to Agapenemy, where she immediately transfers all of her money to Prince, and then she sues her brother, cousin, and brother-in-law for abduction and false imprisonment. And she wins, plus damages. Louisa remains at Agapenemy for the rest of her life, though she was never married. Prince did use some of the money from Louisa to increase the height of the walls around the estate, and purchased two bloodhound dogs to help stave off future kidnappings. Eventually, after Louisa's death, her brother, who was the executor on her will, sued Prince in an attempt to recoup the money Louisa had given him, and they got the last word because they won. So you may have noticed by now that 1845, when the second coming was supposed to happen, has come and gone. What happened? Prince tell them that the gates of mercy had closed, and now all they had to do was wait and they would be saved. Inside Agapenemy, Prince's followers, who had increased from roughly 60 to about 200 within the past few years, and who had come to call him Beloved or the Lamb, worked day in and day out on the property, tending the gardens and maintaining the house. Prince held all the wealth, no one was paid a penny for their work, and he surrounded himself with the most attractive women to attend to his personal needs. And no one questioned him. That would be as egregious as questioning God himself. Fully buying into his own bullshit as well, Prince had this idea that as the physical manifestation of the literal Holy Ghost, it was his responsibility to transmit love from heaven to earth, and he would do that by having sex with virgins. Trigger warning for sexual assault here. Now, I have no doubt this is not the first time Prince did this, but it seems to be the most publicized occurrence, and you'll see why. At one point, he engaged in the public ceremonial rape of a 16-year-old girl named Zoe Patterson on a billiard table in front of his entire congregation. People said she seemed hypnotized as chapel organ music played in the background and hymns were sung. I am sure she was drugged, not hypnotized. Prince stated that he was the Holy Ghost and he couldn't possibly impregnate anybody. He believed he was only purifying them. But just like he was wrong about the end of the world in 1845, he was wrong about that too, 
and 16-year-old Zoe Patterson fell pregnant. Prince denies the child, calling her a devil child, and this sheer blasphemy and hypocrisy seems to wake up a lot of his followers, and a number of them leave. Despite Prince's horrific treatment of Zoe and her child, Zoe becomes a prominent figure in the Agapemonites and becomes known as the Bride of the Lamb, one of multiple brides, that is. And her daughter, who is named Eve, grows up in the community and goes on to take on a prominent role within the church herself. The press, by the way, as I'm sure you can imagine, loved the Agapemonites. The information and gossip that leaked out from behind the walls supplied them with endless headlines. And the secretive nature of them only made them that much more alluring. On occasion, though, when outsiders were admitted to the compound, they came away with stories that painted a picture of kind of a crumbling, aging population. Their day-to-day lives didn't even seem that religious anymore. They were just shut up in there, playing pool while pretty girls lounged about. And one time, they'd been on a mission, but now they were just stagnant and sad. In 1896, Prince commissioned the building of a new church in Clapton in North London that he named the Ark of the Covenant. One of the first preachers he appointed there was John U. Smith Piggott, who was an ordained Anglican priest. The fact that he was ordained kind of lent a little bit more credence to his sermons, which were, of course, threaded and undermined with Agapemonite ideas. This helped with recruitment, which also elevated Smith Piggott amongst the Agapemonite congregation. Then in 1899, at the age of 88, Henry James Prince dies. And all of his followers are completely blindsided by his death. They truly thought he was immortal. Shock and confusion ricochet throughout the community. There are no funeral burial plans, no instructions in place, no successor. They quickly bury him on the chapel grounds with his coffin positioned vertically so he can be standing on resurrection day. The man is dead. He can no longer stand. This detail of a vertical coffin and the picture it puts in my mind. Listen, if I have to think of it, you have to too. So the community has become unmoored. They are adrift. Some pack their bags and leave. Others take to holding seances to contact Prince to see what they should do next. And then Reverend Smith Pigot says to himself, you know what? Why not me? And he posts himself as the new Messiah of the Agapemonites. A ceremony is held at the Ark of the Covenant Church in Clapton in 1902 before a crowd of 6,000, most of them booing and jeering, declaring Smith Pigot a heretic. It was reported that after the inauguration, Smith Pigot attempted to walk on water on Clapton Pond, which he obviously failed at. I really wish I could have seen that. So realizing it's not entirely safe for him out there in the wild, Smith Pigot moves to Agapenemy with his wife, and the community welcomes him with open arms. He recruits about 15 new young female followers and breathes a little bit of life back into the community. As their leader, Smith Pigot is just as much of a creep as Prince was, of course. He winds up taking a second wife, Ruth Ann Priest, who has three children by him that he names Glory, Power, and Life. When Glory was born in 1905, the registrar who came to record the birth noted the population inside Agapeneme was essentially entirely female. And the local townspeople outside the walls continue to take offense to Smith Pigot and his followers. More flames added to the fire when an ex-member drowns herself in Clapton Pond. And when it's announced that Smith Pigot's second wife has bore two more children by him, this announcement also mentions that Smith Pigot, by the way, is still an accredited Anglican priest. This enrages the public so much that they gather to try and lynch him. Smith Pigot is away, though, and instead the mob is presented with their secretary, Charles Stokes Reed, who they decide is a worthy substitute and is tarred and feathered by the mob. Smith Pigga dies in 1927, and after this, their membership rapidly dwindles. More and more people begin to leave, and one by one, the next in command continued to die until 1929, when only 33 women, one girl, and three men were still a part of the community. In 1956, Smith Piggott's second spiritual bride, Ruth, dies, and the community dissolves for good. Her funeral was the only time outsiders were admitted to the chapel on the estate. So, Whenever I hear stories about cults, my first reaction is, who falls for this stuff? And then when you learn a little bit more about just how many people did willingly sign up and what they were promised and how everyone was singing the praises of the leader and so on, and they're never like, hey, sign up for my cults. They're wellness groups, meditation retreats, 
we're like-minded people looking to change the world. Come help us. And in the case of the Agapemonites, Prince and Smith Pigot were like, don't be afraid of dying. Listen to me. I can help. And these guys have silver tongues. They really make people feel like they have their best interests at heart. And for the women especially, young women in the Victorian era were a burden on their families, right? The goal was to marry off your daughters. In fact, a father would pay his daughter's husband for taking her off his hands. That's what a dowry was. Because women were burdens, we couldn't work really. We had to be kept. So, you know, you got to unload these daughters ASAP, better find someone just good enough or otherwise burden your own family for your entire life. Oh, also, you better have babies like it's your job because it is. It's your job. So when Prince and Smith Piggo were like, come stay with me, ladies. You'll be in a spiritual marriage. No baby making required. You'll live in a nice place. We have nice food. We'll just wait for the apocalypse. But don't be afraid. I talked to God and you're a good one so you'll be saved. Just come on down. Yep, just sign over your savings to me so we can build this house. We have nice gardens. Come on. Or at least I imagine it went something like that. Now, I am in no way condoning or making excuses for any of these leaders. They did exploit a lot of people in some very disgusting ways. But it sounds to me like people lived there very comfortably and happily for a long time. If you want an interesting perspective on this, there is a book by the granddaughter of Smith Pigot, whose mother was one of the illegitimate children fathered through the holy purifications that Smith Pigot practiced. The book is called A Boat of Love, Growing Up in a Messianic Cult by Kate Barlow. Kate and her sisters grew up at the Abode of Love in the 1950s, though by that time the group was very much in decline, and to young Kate it was just her home that happened to be a giant mansion with a bunch of old ladies living there. The old ladies were the last of Smith Pigot's followers. She, of course, grows up to uncover the history of her family, and it's quite interesting. So what do you guys think? Do you think this was an opportunity for women to choose the lesser of two evils, or were they just all crazy? Or would you have yourself moved into the abode of love? If you head over to Instagram or TikTok at a goodnight for a murder, you can let me know there. Plus, see some photos of the buildings and grounds of Agapeneme, both cult leaders, and some morning of funeral custom photos from tonight's Victorian Society tip. You can also see the photos and all source links in the episode blog on my website at a goodnight for a murder.com. Plus, you can sign up for the Goodnight for a Murder newsletter on the website. Each month, I send an episode roundup, reveal of next month's episodes, and other goodies like book recommendations, extra Victorian society tips, and more. The bonus content for Housekeeper and Butler tier Patreons for this episode, as I mentioned earlier, is a deeper dive into the Victorian cult of death, which is not a cult in the same way the Agapemonites were, but equally fascinating. To subscribe to Patreon and learn more about the podcast, you can visit agoodnightforamurder.com, also, follow me on Instagram or TikTok at a goodnight for a murder. Please rate and review and share with your friends. Thank you so much for listening, and I will talk to you again soon. Bye.